Can you hear me? Guess not. Oh, got me? Okay, there you go. Your Bibles will be in Luke 15. be in Luke 15, we're going to go from verse 11 down through verse 18. We won't be there right at the start, but if you just hold it, we'll come to it and spend the bulk of our time uh, right in this passage. Let's pray. Lord, you're glorious, and this time is special. I pray, Lord, that You would glorify the Son of God through the Word of God to the glory of God amongst the people of God. That you would cause us, Lord, to see you and feel the weight of your truth on our lives. Pray you would help us in our walk, which we need help with. Pray, Lord, as I'm speaking, Lord, that your grace would be going forth to your people, giving them spiritual life. If there are any who are unregenerate, that you would be waking them from the dead, rising them and bringing them into your sheepfold. We trust you now, Lord. This is a faith-filled exercise. We believe you're speaking, and we trust you to feed us. We love you. Amen. So last week, our pastor was speaking about like the elections. And if you were here last Sunday night, there was a woman who gave a testimony as she was, she was joining. And pastor always asked, how did you get here and what's going on? And she was just going on and on gloriously about the sovereignty of God. I believe she was diagnosed with cancer. And she was talking about how the sovereignty of God was what? preserved her in a very, very difficult ordeal. I was sitting in the nursery uh, with Ezra while that was happening, and I was thinking as I was putting this message together, wow, confirmation, confirmation, confirmation. I want to talk on the sovereignty of God. I want to help us see it, perhaps for the first time. If not, I want to remind it and bring it to front view. We live in a world that if you don't have the sovereignty of God, looks completely out of control. It looks as if no one's pulling the strings. It looks as if whoever's got the most money, the most power, the most guns, is just doing whatever they want to do. That's not true. And that's what I want to try to show you this morning. When you look at the world around you, I want you to know that God has an answer for the things that you see. Of course, we know Maranatha Bible Church, we preach, we're faithful to preach the gospel here. We know that ultimately every answer to every problem is the gospel. If a man or woman will believe the gospel, that settles just about everything. Because we know that, we must learn the gospel. We must love the gospel. and We must share the gospel as often as we have occasion. I just want to interject at this point that the gospel is more than John 3.16. It is John 3.16, but it's more than that. So if you're thinking, I know the gospel because I know John 3.16, you need to learn the gospel. Beyond knowing the gospel and being able to share it articulately with someone The sovereignty of God is something that I want to highlight because it's something that will strengthen us, comfort us, and kind of stabilize us in the midst of when we look out there and look at elections and terrorism and hurricanes and things that seem awful that we don't understand. Now, the theologically illiterate will say every one of those things is just the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil as if the devil ran the world. You might not admit that you believe the devil runs the world, but every time something bad happens, you, don't, you call on who? 
Let up. As if he were the sovereign power in the world. He is not. 1 Timothy 6.15, you have Paul writing to Timothy. He refers to Christ. He says, he, Christ, who is the blessed and only sovereign. Not just sovereign, he's the only sovereign. When I say sovereign, what do I mean? I mean he is the only one who has any control. He's the only source of power to make anything happen. Everything that happens, happens at his allowance and no one else's. That's what you might not believe. He, Christ, who is the blessed and only sovereign king of kings. Are there other kings? Yes. But who's the king of all the kings? Exactly. Are there other lords? Yes. But who is the lord of all the lords? Not the devil. I want to read you a quote from Pastor John Piper on why. Why we should think about the sovereignty of God. Listen to this. Quote. Sometimes we need to be reminded by God himself that there are no limits to his rule. We need to hear from him that he is sovereign over the whole world and everything that happens in it. We need his own reminder that he is never helpless, never frustrated, never at a loss. We need his assurance, his assurance that, we, that he reigns over ISIS over terrorism, Syria, Russia, China, India, Nigeria, France, Myanmar, Saudi Arabia, and the United States of America. Every nation, every people, every language, every tribe, every chief, every president, every king, every prime minister, every politician, great or small. Sometimes we need to hear specific statements from God about his own authority. We need to hear God's own words, for it is the very words of God that have unusual power to settle our nerves and to make us stable, wise, and courageous. When you look out in that world, the world doesn't need you scared, confused, and doubting. It needs you stable, wise, and courageous. So on the heels of that, I want to read you some verses that present God in this way. I want you to think, as I read these verses, of God high in the heavens, sitting on an unmovable, unshakable throne, decreeing all things that come to pass, using all things that come to pass for the good of those who will be called into his sheepfold. Not one random molecule in the universe. If there was one random molecule in all of the universe, God is not God. He is sovereign over all things, not just all good things. He's sovereign over all things, not just all good things. To doubt this would to bring, would to bring into question the very godness of God. Some of us have a God here, and the devil is just a tick below him. No. The devil is God's devil. You read in 1 Peter 5, I wasn't going to go here, but Lord's bringing me this way. You read in 1 Peter 5, it says the devil roams around seeking who he, what's the next word? May devour. Why does it say may? Because he needs what? Permission. Why? Listen to these verses. Psalm 115, verse 3. But our God is in the heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Psalm 135, 6. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. In heaven and in the earth, in the seas and in all the deep places. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. Remember the former things of old. 
for I am God. There is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. You hear God now? This is the God that you know, I hope. This is the God that you pray to, I hope. Listen to how Job referred to God in Job Job 42 too. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Do you know that? Do you know that when God says yes on something, it's a yes, not dependent on whether you want it to happen or not, not dependent on your cooperation, not dependent on your permission. If God wanted to turn you and stand you on your head right in front of this church right now, he wouldn't ask you first. He would just do it. Because he doesn't need your permission. What kind of God would it be if he needed your permission? He needs nothing. He needs nothing. That's why we call him the all-sufficient. He's all-sufficient. In himself, there is no lack. 1 Peter 3 and 22, in reference to Jesus. Jesus, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers, have all powers having been made subject to him. When he rose, what did he say? Some power is given to me in heaven and earth, and the devil has the rest. He says, all power is given to who? Me, where? Come on, Bible. Come on, Bible church. In heaven and where? So who's the only one with power? Psalm 33 and 10. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. 1 Samuel 2, 6 and 7. Listen to this one. The Lord kills and the Lord brings life. He brings down to Sheol, and he raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low, and he exalts. Do you know a God who does those things? Listen to this one. John 6, 65. Therefore, I have said to you, Jesus speaking, that no man can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. What is that? Is that in the Bible? I hear you think, is that in the Bible? Sure it is. It's in John 6, 65. Who said it? Jesus said it. What does it mean? It means you can't even approach the sovereign God of the universe unless he gives you permission to do so. These verses, and there are hundreds more I could have read. These verses ought to put steel in your spine. You have a God who cannot be refused. They ought to create boldness in your prayer life, knowing that when you pray, you speak to that person. When you, you already, you know how I know you already believe what I, how many of y'all have asked God to save someone? Look at the hands. How many of you raise it up higher? How many of you have asked God in your prayer time to save another person? So you do believe in his sovereignty then. Because you didn't, you didn't say God save them if he allows you to. You went in that closet, you closed that door, and you cried out to God and you said, God save my son. Why did you do it? Because you believed that God was able to save that boy whether he wanted you to or not. This is the God we need now. We need a strong God. We need one who does what he pleases. And this is the God you speak to. Now I want to go to Luke 15. 
all those verses that I just read, God's over kingdoms, he's over kings, he's over big things, he's over salvation. But now I want to show you it kind of on a smaller scale in a place that you probably read this story and heard it many, many, many times. But I want to kind of tease out a couple of details that uh, arrested me when I was reading. I was actually reading through the book of Luke. And as I was, uh, some of these details arrested me. So when pastor asked to preach, I thought, Phew, these would be some good insights to share. So we're going to start at verse, fifth, I'm sorry, verse 11 of Luke chapter 15. And it reads this way. I'm coming from New King James. Then he said, Jesus speaking, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood, for 13, and not, as many, not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far off country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a, sub- a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. 15. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and sent him into the fields to feed swine. He would gladly have been fi- had filled his, his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. No one gave him anything. 17. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. How many of you are familiar with that story? They, what do they call it? They call it the prodigal son, right? And usually when that story is being spoken about, you're asking wayward people, wayward people have backslidden, come on back, look, look how you just like the son, you did the exact same thing, come on back home. God is the father, right? God is waiting there. He's, he's been looking for you and he's been wanting you. And when you come back, he'll be there. He'll forgive you. He'll restore you. I'm not going to focus on any of those details right now in the story. But we're going to pull, going to try to tease out some other details. Look at verse 13. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country and squandered his property in reckless living. This man, representative of most men, if not all men, most men, if not all men, do basically one thing, what they want to do. And this is what this guy did. Here the prodigal son embraces a naturalistic philosophy. 1 Corinthians 15, 32, here Paul says it. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That's how he's living. That's how most people live. Do as much as I can, as fast as I can, have as much thrills as I can, because it could be over. And when it's over, there's nothing. That's naturalism. Now, That's fine out there, but if that's how you live, the whole altar is is there for you. Because that is not the Christian way to live, right? So the son is unregenerate. He's living an unregenerate life. Give me what's mine so I can go do what I want. Leave me alone. I don't want to answer to anybody, and I'm see you later. I'm gone. In fact, some of y'all probably did that very same thing. I know I did. Of course, my mom didn't give me any money. She just said, have a good day. So we're familiar with the idea. You, you understand emotionally what this guy is thinking. He's like, I want to get away. I want to do me, as they used to say. Now notice in the story, when he asks for his inheritance, the father doesn't try to argue with him. He doesn't try to give him any proverbs on why it's not a good idea, like I would probably do to my kids if they asked me that. I'd be scripture, scripture, scripture. He doesn't say anything. He just gives it. No panic. No alarm. No worry. Why? If you're taking notes, I want you to write this point down. Why? Why no worry? Why no hesitation? Why just give them and let it go? Because there is more mercy and power in God than there is sin in you. That's why. There is more mercy in God than there is sin in you. And there is more power in God than there is rebellion in you. Therefore, go ahead and rebel. I'll bring you back when I'm ready. That's what it is. That's that's how God sits. When you you turn your eye to God and you say, God, I don't want anything to do with you, okay. And I'll bring you back when I'm ready or if I'm ready. The guy got serious all of a sudden. 
if I'm ready. He doesn't have to. I was thinking about that this morning. I was reading the passage again. If the son came, when the son came back, the father could have just been like, nope. You are a moron. I don't want anything to do with you. Question, would the father have been well within his rights to do so? He gave him what he owed him. He gave him the money. Go about your business. Some will run to God like that, and they might not find him standing, waiting, and going, come on. They may say, sorry, gate's closed. No panic. More mercy in God, more power in God than there is sin in you. Verse 14, when he had spent everything, now here's, here, notice the detail. When he had spent everything, so he's out doing what he wants to do, no one's stopping him, he's doing everything in his mind and in his little dirty soul that, could, that comes into his mind. And then it says, when he had spent it all, no more money, then a severe famine arises in the country, and he began to be in need. If the famine comes before the money is out, he won't feel it. But the famine comes right when the money runs out. Now, a pagan, an unregenerate, would just say, oh, that's bad luck. A Christian would say, that's the sovereign hand of God driving this kid back home. Listen to Isaiah 47, 45, 7. You say, wow, would, would, God, would God cause a famine? Would God do that just to drive poor prodigal son home? Would God make prodigal son suffer? No, I know God would never make anyone suffer. Listen to Isaiah 45, 7. St striking verse. I, this is God talking in the imperative. I, God. Form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. Oh, no, that had to be the devil, brother. <laughs> the famine came when it would hurt him the most. Verse 16, and he was longing, back in, back in Luke 15, verse 16, and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And here's another one. And no one gave him anything. Curious? Here again, we find the son under the, under, under the sub, subject to the sovereign hand of God. You say, well, Nathan, the Lord would never leave a guy who's hungry hungry. He would always come and help out, you know, someone who needs it. Listen to Psalm 105, 25. He's, this, is, this is David recounting about the children of Israel with Moses. Listen to how what he says God did. He, he God, turned their, the Egyptians, heart to hate his people and to deal craftily with his servants. Who turned their hearts? God prevented, key word, prevented anyone from helping the son. Why? Son must go home. Right? All of a sudden, if everybody starts putting change in this guy's pocket, he ain't going home. He's going back to prodigal. So what does God do? He just gently, behind the scenes, turns everyone away from this guy. Hey, brother, will you help me? Nope. Hey, brother, will you? Nope. He spares up? Nope. You say, man, what's going on? God's going on. God prevented everyone, anyone from helping this boy, further driving him back. And then, of course, the key point in verse 17, then he came to himself. Now, it must be asserted at this point. He did, the Bible says he came to himself. But what I want you to know is, although it says he came to himself, he did not come to himself by himself. 
You did not come to yourself by yourself. Listen to John Calvin on verse 17. Instructed by this example, let us not imagine that God deals cruelly with us. If at any time he visits us with heavy afflictions, for in this manner those who are obstinate and intoxicated, like this guy was, with mirth and partying are taught to be obedient. In short, all the miseries which we endure are profitable, profitable, a profitable invitation to repentance. God turns everybody away. That's not a cruel deed. That's a loving deed. Why? Because he came to himself. If he didn't ever come to himself, yeah, it's just a cruel God doing cruel things. If God had to whip me daily to get me saved, he should. And it would be loving of him to do it. If God had to bankrupt me to save my soul, that's a loving act. Because it, puts, it shows you that God, what does God value? He doesn't mind you tearing up. He doesn't mind you cursing him. He doesn't mind you, I don't, I don't, he doesn't mind all that if salvation is there for you, and it is. He will do what is necessary. We cripple God. We put handcuffs on him. Well, you know, if, if, I, if, I, if you cooperate with him, brother, ah, if you cooperate. He is a lion. What is, what is cooperation? He takes what he wants. He does what he will. That's not cruel. This, this prodigal son was not being treated wrong. He was being, being treated right. He came to himself, but not by himself. And then he says, I will arise and go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. That's how you know it's been God the whole time. That's how you know. If he had just went home and said, Daddy, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a good son, I'm sorry. Wasted the money, did everything bad, uh, can I come work for you? Then God's not in it at all. But what does he do? He doesn't come home and say that. He says, I have violated heaven now. And that's how you know he was truly saved. Countless times the altar comes open and people will come up and they'll start apologizing for, oh, I messed my mother over. Oh, I cheated on my taxes. That's not how you get saved. That's not how you get saved at all. In fact, that's how you feel self-righteous. Sin is first and foremost against God. You come up to this altar and talk about anything other than your sin and how grievous it is in the sight of God, you're going to walk away a, a feeling a little bit better, still a sinner. Psalm 51.4, against you and you only have I sinned. When you come like that, when you, when you recognize the sovereign hand of God moving, regeneration is there. You say, yes, Dad, I've not been good, but first, let me hold that, God, I've not been good. And I realize the famine, the turning of people away, the, the lowering of my position, it's all been you driving me back home. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? That's how you get saved. In fact, that's how each person in here who is saved got saved. You may never have thought of it in those terms before, but that's exactly what happened. As I close, God controls the heavens. He controls what happens above the skies. He controls the earth below the ground. He controls all the systems at work in this world, whether atmospheric, geological, or natural. He controls all the powers in this world. Kings rise and fall and make decisions at his leading. He makes nations great and brings them to dust. He causes people, men, to be great men, and he brings great men down as fast as he raises them. He causes you to believe the gospel day by day. 
He shines light into your souls to regenerate you for the first time. He draws men to Christ, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Psalms 9:10. And those who know your name, for this morning, for those who know you as sovereign, will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, will not forsake the one who seeks you. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Pray, Lord, that you have fed us, given us grace, convicted us, caused us to see your sovereign hand in this world and in our lives, Lord. Pray it glorified you. Pray these would glorify you as well in their lives. We thank you for the word of God. Love you. In your name we pray. Amen.